minutes I'm going to ask you to give me a vote on whether or not so I have about five problems to present today and would you rather have me do them in Excel so that they'll be um, kind of neat and organized on and you can see how I would set them up in Excel or would you rather have me handwrite them because that's the speed at which you take notes is when I handwrite so you'll have to tell me which you prefer and we'll take a vote I'll do it either way <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Trying my best. <laughs> <laughs> so when is your, because you have a, like a show coming up, right? Is that what you were yeah, saying? Yeah, Thursday. This Thursday? It's, it's been difficult. I'm like living between two cities. Mm -hmm. But. This too shall pass, right? Yeah. <laughs> It'll be over soon. freaking out. Half my clothes are in Paducah, half my clothes are here. My suitcase is in Paducah, so like what's here I can't pack yet. Oh. <laughs> well, so you guys probably know I have two sons that are, one's 20 and one's 21, soon to be 22. Anyway, my 20, soon to be 22 year old lives in Nashville, or outside of Nashville right now. And anyway, we have a lot of his stuff in our garage because he moved into a furnished place there. And so. Anyway, my husband was out kind of cleaning and organizing the stuff, and he found this, like, tub of stuff, like clothes. And so he did laundry, and this is, so there were, like, 11 pairs of socks in this laundry thing. And we're like, he, like, must have no socks with him, you know? <laughs> or he's gone out and bought new, or, you know? And anyways, we were talking to him on the phone this week, and I was like, yeah, I wondered where those all got off to. <laughs> like, yeah. And then the other thing is there were like four pair of like that had no match. I mean that were all one color and you're like, okay, so he's had none of those. You know? <laughs> but Joseph Aiden has kind of an array of things to choose from. So he did that while he was going to school at UK. <laughs> is it hot? Yeah. I guess it's from like whenever you walk from like from outside inside, like and then you like walk up the stairs, and you're like, I'm going to die. Like, <laughs> outside to inside, then with the coat and hat and everything, right? Yeah. Well, my Fitbit told me that I did 37 flights of stairs yesterday, so Oops. I'm not sure if I'm buying all that. But <laughs> I did go up and down the stairs here multiple times, and I was over at the Curve Center and went up and down the stairs there multiple times. But I'm not thinking it was 37 flights, but I don't know whether it like somehow was counting. You know, every little section. I don't yeah. know. If you go up like four flights, like four stairs, it'll count as a flight of stairs sometimes. Yeah, so I don't think it's always real consistent. It's not like one, like certain number of yeah, stairs. Like yeah, ten stairs or something. Yeah, yeah. it <laughs> says that it somehow tracks your elevation, and I'm like, so somebody could have all kinds of information on this, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly, like literally, exactly. 
All right, it's 9.30. Let's go ahead and get rolling. <clears throat> um, <laughs> so I guess we have been rolling. I thought I had it on pause, but it wasn't. Oh. So. <laughs> um, that being said, let's take a quick look at where we're at and where we're headed. Um, so today is Tuesday, March 2nd. So you should have turned in your Project Bs last night. If you didn't, you should have already talked to me about an extension. I'll, I'll do them for, for legitimate reasons. Um, and um, But if you haven't talked to me about an extension and you feel like you have a legitimate reason, I'll take those conversations for the next day or two, and then after that, We've missed that window of opportunity. I think that's a responsibility thing. Um, so that being said, um, you should have got your Project B turned in, and your presentations then are due next week, right? And they shouldn't be. They're just going to be what you would present to the client. We talked about those in the last class period, so I'm not going to repeat that. You can. Um, you should have had some notes from that, on, and, and then I've uh, added to the assignment out on Canvas so that it's clear about what that is. Um, this week, we're continuing with Chapter 5, Flow Rate and Capacity Analysis. What we're going to be going over today builds on what we did last Thursday. Um, and so it's just a different tweak on what we did. Um, and so I'll try to talk you through that. And then at the end of class, we're going to do um, five examples. Those five examples, I said, some of you weren't in the room, but what I said was I can either do them in Excel Right, and show you how I would set them up to do them in Excel, or I can do them by hand. Um, how many would prefer that I do them in Excel versus by hand? How many would prefer I do them by hand? Okay, there you go. Is that the speed at which you take notes? Okay. Yeah. It's prettier when I do it in Excel, but that's okay. Well, <laughs> uh, um, so that's kind of our, our game plan for today, and then Thursday we'll finish up Chapter 5. Following Tuesday we'll do an exam review. Following Thursday you'll have an exam over Chapters 4 and 5. You should be finishing up the goal, right? Um, and I think most of you are on track with that, so I think that's good. All right? So let me go ahead and kind of pick up where we left off on Thursday. So again, this is our second lecture on Chapter 5, which is about flow rate and capacity analysis. Just to kind of remind you where we were at on Thursday, right, we were talking about the example of an insurance processing uh, claims company. And they had, <coughs> basically, we started out looking at one particular type of claim, and that was a physician's claim. And we knew what the unit load was because that's how much time it takes for each resource, right? And so we have the different resources listed over here on the left, how much time it takes for them to actually complete that. Okay, so one minute per claim for mailroom, five minutes data entry, eight minutes claims processor, two and a half for the claim supervisor. Then to get the effective capacity of that, we take the inverse of that relationship, right? So, and I have to tell you, I still have to remind myself. So. You know, unit load is time per unit, okay? And unit load, unit is the denominator, okay? And effective capacity, it's unit per time. So unit becomes the numerator, okay? And so you're just going to have to, because I still have to go look just to make sure I've got my head on straight, right? So make a note, figure out how you're going to remember that. But unit load is time per unit, units in the denominator, okay? Capacity is unit per time, units in the numerator, okay? And then in this example, we just took the number of units in that resource pool and said, well, if I have one mailroom clerk and it takes them one claim, it's one claim per minute is their effective capacity, the effective capacity of that resource pool is just multiplied the number of resources times the effective capacity of, a, of an individual resource unit. Okay. We're going to put a, a couple of tweaks on that today, but that's the basics, right? And then we ended class talking about, but now we're going to look at, we've got not only a physician claim, but we have a hospital claim, which is a different product type. Okay, so we have these two product types, a physician claim and a hospital claim. And if we did the same kind of analysis on the hospital claim, right, it takes... The, the unit load is different. The time that it takes per unit is different. So it's one and a half minutes for the mailroom clerk, six for the data entry clerk, eight for the claims processor, and 
uh, four for the claim supervisor. Okay, so <clears throat> that being said, then um, we follow through and we take the inverse, right? And then we multiply by the number of units in the resource pool and we get our effective capacity of um, a hospital claim. And so again, our bottleneck is still the mailroom clerk, but instead of being able to do one claim per minute, they're only able to do 0.67 claims per minute, okay? And so, you know, later on today, we're gonna be talking about the capacity of those processes. And so the capacity of the mailroom clerk, if they can do one claim per minute, right, and that's the bottleneck of the process, that's also the capacity of the process. Everybody making that linkage, right? The bottleneck capacity is the, is the capacity of the process. So we look at this and we would say, well, the mailroom clerk is the bottleneck, right? Because they have the lowest effective capacity. And so if the mailroom clerk can do 0.67 claims per minute, right? So I'm just going to, let's back up and do, do the physician one because it's easy math. If the... Um, Physician's claim can do one, the mailroom clerk can do one claim per minute. How many claims can they do in an hour? 60. 60, right? Okay. So if that's the case, and now we have our mailroom clerk for the hospital claim, and they can only do 0.67, right? The math in my head is that's two-thirds. So two-thirds of 60 is going to be 40 claims, right, per hour, right? And so that's the capacity per hour of the two different types of claims, right? But the problem of trying to look at them individually is that, of course, they're using the same resources. So we can't necessarily say that's the capacity because they're using the same resources. So we have to somehow address product mix, and we're going to do that using weighted averages. Okay? And so if our physician claims are 60% of our business and our hospital claims are 40% of our business, Right? We need to then use that information to calculate what we call an artificial unit load. Okay? And then we use our artificial unit load to find the capacity of the process. Okay? So let me just kind of to restate that. For a process that produces several types of products simultaneously, we can represent that overall flow of various products by constructing an artificial flow unit, which represents the entire mix of those products. And we can calculate the unit load of the mix by taking a weighted average of the unit loads of the individual products using the percentage of the mix for our weights. Okay, and so of course we have an example of that. So example 5.4 continued then at the top is just here's the two different types of claims, right? The unit load for the physician and the unit load for the hospital. And so, you know, that's the information that was given to us in the problem, okay? And so then to calculate our artificial unit load for each resource type, I'm going to take, um, again, we said that 60% physician, 40% hospital. So I'm going to come here and I'm going to go 1 times 60% plus 0.4 times the hospital of 1.5 gives me my artificial unit load of 1.2, okay? Same thing here, 60% times 5 plus 40% times 6 gives me my artificial unit load of 5.4. 60% times 8 plus 40% times 8 amazingly gives me 8, right? So there's no difference there. 2.5 times 60% plus 4 times 40% uh, gives me a unit load of 3.1 minutes per claim, okay? So all I'm doing is substituting that first column when I'm looking at one type of product now I'm substituting that first column in those tables we were working on with the artificial unit load instead of the individual product unit load. Okay, so then I plug into my table, I have the resource pools, I have the artificial unit load, then I take the inverse of that to get the effective capacity of an individual resource unit. I multiply that by the number of resources in that pool and that's going to give me the effective capacity of the, the the process for each of those resources. So this is exactly what we did last week, sorry, but the only difference is we're substituting that first column where we had individual product unit loads, now we have our artificial unit load. So it's just kind of a pre-step where you have to calculate the artificial unit load. Does that make sense to everybody? So is the unit load supposed to be like 60% plus 40% then? So your unit load it's always going to, you're always going to be identifying 100% of your product mix, right? And so in this case, it's going to be 
Yeah, so if you're asking me, it's 60% times 1 plus 40% times 1.5 is okay. how I get to my 1.2. So what's the 60% minus 40%? Oh, that's not, that's just, um, that's not minus, that's just a, the... Oh, like, but... Okay. Yeah, it's just saying they're two different gotcha. numbers. Sorry. Very fine. Okay. I'm sure there'll be somebody else out there with the same question, so that's good that you asked. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, so that being said... Of course, the next thing is, can we determine which of the two claims that we process is more profitable? And of course, the answer is yes, right? So you know that's what we're going to do next, is how do we answer that question? So we have to supplement the data on capacities for those two products with some financial information where we talk about revenues and variable costs, okay? And so we're given in um, this problem, we're given what's called the unit contribution margin of each flow unit, okay? So that's, this is, contribution margin is language that you've heard before, but you've probably not applied it in an operations course, so you might have to refresh your memory. So contribution margin is your revenue from a product minus your variable costs. So it's not taking into account your fixed costs, okay? And so what we've got here is our revenues per unit are $5.50 for a physician claim, and our variable costs are 50 cents per unit. And so our unit contribution margin is $5 per unit, okay? <clears throat> for a hospital claim, right, our revenues per unit are $6.75 per unit, variable cost is 75 cents per unit, and our unit contribution margin is $6 per unit. So just looking at that information, which one appears to be more profitable? That's really not a hard question. Hospital claim? Yeah, the hospital claim appears to be more profitable. But what we're going to learn in this chapter is it's not enough to just look at the contribution margin. We have to look at the contribution margin per unit of time, okay? And you'll see, I think, as we work through this problem, why that matters, okay? Um, <clears throat> all right. So from our analysis of capacity, right, our effective capacity of a physician's claim is 60 units per hour and the effective capacity of a hospital claim is 40 units per hour. Remember when we did that at the kind of a few slides ago? Okay, so if I make $5 on each unit of a physician's claim, it's 5 times 60, says that I can make a potential profit of $300 per hour versus my hospital claim where I can make actually my contribution margin is higher, but I, can, I can't produce as many of them. So then I only make 40 an hour. So then that's my potential profit per hour is $240 per hour, okay? And so sometimes we get really excited about looking at contribution margin and we're not looking at the bigger picture, right? We need to put it in context of per unit of time so that we're making it, uh, an effective comparison, okay? So as that example demonstrates, the relevant criterion in determining unit profitability of products is not the contribution margin per unit, but the contribution margin per unit of time, okay? All right. Um, there was something else I wanted to address and I skipped over it, so I'm gonna go back to it real quick. Um, on this slide, I think it's interesting <clears throat> that, so you need to make a distinction that you have to do your um, your weighted average on the unit load. You can't calculate the effective capacity and then do the weighted average on the effective capacity because it doesn't work out the same, okay? And I have a problem that we're going to work today and I'll show you because it look when we look at it, we're going to jump to a conclusion about what it should be and then we're going to realize we're wrong, okay? And so what the takeaway is when you do your weighted average, it needs to be on the unit load, not on the effective capacity. Okay, so um, again, I'll demonstrate that with a problem here later on, okay? All right, so um, in section 5.4, we talk about capacity waste and theoretical capacity, which ties right into our um, the uh, flow time and theoretical flow time, right? So <coughs> just apply it to capacity. So capacity includes wasted time, <coughs> right? Theoretical capacity pulls that wasted time out. Waste drivers of that can be <clears throat> if you have 
um, resource breakdown, if you have maintenance issues, if you have quality rejects, rework, setups between different product batches, and non-value adding activity. All those things can play into why we might not have, um, why we might not be achieving our highest capacity. Okay, so <clears throat> unit load, as we've been talking about, it is an aggregation given the way the resources are currently being utilized of both productive as well as wasted time. Right? So if capacity waste is large, that's some place that we might want to turn our attention to waste elimination. And so we want to figure out how can we segregate out what that waste capacity is. Okay? And we use a method to do that. Um, and so to do that, we get to our theoretical unit load, which is, again, should tie right into when we talked about flow unit and theoretical uh, flow time. Right? It's the minimal amount of time required to process a flow unit if all waste is eliminated. So theoretical capacity is the reciprocal of the theoretical unit load, okay? Because again, unit load and capacity, capacity is the reciprocal of the unit load, okay? So the thing about theoretical capacity is it represents a highly idealized and seldom achievable notion of capacity, okay? Its usefulness derives from the fact that it estimates the waste in the system and it says, is this something that we should be focused on? And if the waste is high, then the answer is yes, we should be focused on it. If the waste is low, then okay, there's probably other things that we need to address, okay? Um, and, it, and so kind of remember that, the way the chapter flows, we, we address that in Thursday's lecture a little bit more. But um, again, that's we're looking at the waste and, and whether it's high or not. So our example that we have uh, from the text is example five, six, and it says, Consider the operating room a resource unit of a hospital which specializes in cataract surgery. On average, the hospital manages to perform a surgery every 30 minutes. So that's the unit load, right? One surgery every 30 minutes times on the bottom, that's our unit load. Thus, the effective capacity is, so it would be then uh, one surgery every 0.5 hours. So then we, if we were going to convert that to hours, our effective capacity would, would be 1 over 0.5 which gives us two surgeries per hour, okay? And if we have one operating room, okay, and we have an effective, and, and our waste factor is 33%. So 33% of the time, right, the operating room is wasted cleaning, restocking, changeover of nursing staff, fixing of malfunctioning equipment, and so forth. So then we can calculate our theoretical capacity, and it kind of drifts off to the slide. I'm sorry about that. But what you're doing is you're saying, well, we're going to take our effective capacity, of two surgeries per hour and divide it by one minus our capacity waste factor, which is one minus 0.33. So if I take the theoretical effective capacity of two and divide it by 0.67, one minus 0.33, right, it's going to tell me that it's going to end up being our, our theoretical capacity is three surgeries an hour. And so you say, well, Okay, well, we can't eliminate all of those things, right? So we're probably never going to achieve the three surgeries per hour. But there's probably some of these things that we can eliminate. And it gives you that idea of, you know, well, how much more space is there if you were able to eliminate waste, okay? And so it's, um, again, that, and sometimes students get hung up on, because you're going to be asked to calculate a capacity waste factor in your analysis, right? And it is not a perfect science. And so you're going to document what your assumptions are and why you think what it is, and you're just going to develop a capacity waste factor to use in your project, okay? There's no perfect answer. So, um, and I think sometimes, you know, in, when we're in our uh, undergraduate, you know, oftentimes <coughs> we're given information as though it's this perfect thing. That's not the case. This is something that you use to make decisions off of, but it's unlikely that you're going to have all of the details to be able to make that perfect uh, decision. Okay. So before I do the five problems, I thought I'd like to just hit a couple of the discussion questions at the back to kind of make sure that you're uh, tracking with the, the concepts that we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> so 5.2 says um, we want to explain the concept of unit load and theoretical unit load for an airline such as Southwest Airlines. Okay. So <coughs> First off, we just covered it. What's the difference between theoretical unit load and unit load? And I'll just start here and go around the room because that'll be easier than waiting on everybody to try to answer. Troy, what do you think the difference is? I mean, theoretical, isn't that the minimum? 
Without waste. Without waste, right? So then, Julie, if we were talking about Southwest Airlines, and let's just talk about as they pull up to the gate, what kinds of things could be considered waste in that process? They normally just like sit, the plane will like sit there just like waiting for things to happen, and then like whenever they're, like after they move the thing to like get people on the plane, they like wait again. So there's just a lot of wait time. Right. So if you can, and again, Southwest is actually one of the, the, the airlines that's really probably the best at that. And so one of the reasons that, that they're successful is they've figured out ways to eliminate waste in that process of, because that's absolutely not value added. You know, you're thinking about that resource of the airplane, which is so expensive. And the longer that you have it and your pilots sitting there waiting, right, you're, <coughs> you're wasting uh, your resources. Okay? So that's, that's good. Um, <clears throat> So Miranda, the theoretical capacity of a process is the reciprocal of the theoretical flow time of the process. Do you agree? Mm. Is that a yes? Mm. No. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it is a yes, okay? Um, so that's, and if you think about it, it's because of, if you think about, um, what did I say capacity What's the numerator and denominator in capacity? Okay, so so capacity is unit load is what per what? Uh, unit per oh, no time per unit. Unit yeah. load is time per unit. Time per unit. Time per unit. So capacity is unit per time. Unit per time. And flow time is. Time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, it was really not a trick question. So then, if if our theoretical capacity is unit per time, right, and flow time is time, right, that means that we've got that relationship that we can use again. Theoretical capacity is the reciprocal of the theoretical flow time. Okay. So, um, Abby. Can you think of um, some examples of any service organizations? And we'll look, ask for some help. because So Abby and anybody else can think of anything. Can you think of any service organizations that rely mainly on setup reductions to improve their capacity and throughput? Setup reductions. So the changeover between one operation to the next. Any service organizations that you can think of? Would like the Red Cross be one? Like with blood drives? Yeah. Be because it's about, it's about when I go from one patient to the next, right? It's yeah. about how quickly can I move that through it and make that change, right? Because then basically once you get them hooked up, they're, they're good to go. That's a good example, right? Anybody have any others that you can think of? Let's come up with at least two others. What else is kind of dependent on changeovers, like between... The tanning bed. Yeah. Right? So, because it's, it's that, again, kind of once you get in it, you're done. Right? It's the how quickly can we change people. <clears throat> I think that's a great example. I was thinking of even, you know, and, and you can you can take most examples and come up with at least a portion of it that you can apply that to. You think about a hair salon and you go in and you're, somebody, you know, works on you and then they have to clean up and, and get ready for the next person. That's kind of a minor example. The hospital example that we just talked about is a great one, right? They have to stop and clean and get everything reset before they can start. So, again, um, some examples of those service organizations that rely on the setup reductions. All right. Um, so, Austin, uh, examples of organizations that rely on judicious product mix decisions in order to maximize their throughput or revenue. I'm not sure what that means, judicious. So making um, making the like most judgment. of the fact that they have different product mixes and how do they, you know, how do they address it? Can you anybody think of any examples? So let's just first off think of some some organizations that have different product mixes. I mean Walmart. Walmart has different product mixes because they have clothes, food. Okay. All right. So they have all those different types of things going on. 
Okay. And I almost was thinking more in terms of um, the different types of customers that they have too. I mean, so they have different types of customers as well. So you can look at it from, so because they're, they're not actually producing the different things, but I still think that they're handled differently depending on, on how they are. So maybe like a hair salon? Yeah. Different customers wanting different outputs? Yeah. And so, so you know, I think the example I have in my notes is I go back to my bank example with m myself with two small children and my grandmother going into the bank, right? And so, um, you know, that product mix, we're very different even though for each one customer, right? And so our, our needs and, and satisfaction with the process are very different depending on um, who it is. And so... What you find in that situation is that service organizations that have that mix, right, the type of people that they need to hire to be what we call in the front end of that, to be interfacing with the customers, they have to be um, sharper in terms of understanding the type of customer that they're dealing with and be able to adapt, right? And so you look for a certain set of soft skills with people that you're hiring for those positions Versus if you've got somebody who's doing the same thing again and again and again, right, they don't have to have that, those soft skills to make those judgment calls, right? They're just able to kind of um, repeat, um, do it and repeat. Okay. Um, all right, Chelsea. Comment on the statement, to maximize profitability, it is always better to give priority to, pro to produce products with the highest contribution margin. Do we agree with that or disagree with that? I would disagree. Okay, because you're right. Now now the why. Why would you disagree? Um, what is it that we should focus on rather than just contribution margin? The quality. Okay, so the quality. Um, All right. So we had something specifically from the lecture today that we talked about with that. Do, do, Khalid, do you remember what that is? Uh, what was the question again? I was looking to you. Okay, you were looking at the next one trying to make sure you were ready? <laughs> uh, so the question is, to maximize profitability, it's always better to give priority to produce products with the highest contribution margin. We've come to the conclusion we don't agree with that, but if it's not just contribution margin, what is it that we think we should focus on? Uh, I think the fixed costs too. <coughs> Say that again. Fixed costs too, not just the variables. Okay, yeah. so um, actually when we're talking about what to produce, we kind of assume fixed oh, okay. costs are a given. So what did we talk about in class today? Anybody remember? Contribution per flow unit? Co close. Per, per, per time. time. Per time. Contribution per time is what we should focus on. Okay. So, Khalid, since you looked at the next one, I'm going to... So, doubling the number of units of a bottleneck resource will double the process capacity. Do you agree or disagree? I think... I think yes. Okay. I would say yes, but it depends. What would it depend on? Well, the bottleneck is the least number of products per, per hour or per mm -hmm. the time. So, and that's one of the examples we did yesterday. I mean... So that's true, yeah. but when wouldn't it? So let's say, and um, let's say that we have. So when wouldn't that be the case? So let's say we have five different resources and we double the the bottleneck. When wouldn't it be that we would double the capacity of the process? Abby, you look like you know. <laughs> if like the one of the next steps couldn't double it as well. That's right. So what would happen is it only works if you don't shift the bottleneck, right? Because sometimes, let's say I have a capacity of, an effective capacity of, let's just go back here. Let's look at an actual example. So let's say that I have a, an effective capacity of, um, let's say that this is, well, this is an example like that. So if I doubled the mailroom clerk, right? from 0.83 to 1.6, right? That shifts the bottleneck now to the data entry clerk. And so we couldn't double the process because the data entry clerk can only do 1.48, right? Claims per minute. So that's when it doesn't work, right? It works as long as you're not shifting that bottleneck. But that's what continuous improvement is about, is you work on where your bottleneck is until you fix it, and then you go to the next bottleneck and you work on fixing it, right? So that's kind of, why you're why you're kind of working your way through that okay so sorry to slide through those but okay 
Um, <clears throat> Last but not least, comment on the statement, maximizing utilization of each resource pool is an exercise in futility. Do you agree or disagree? Uh, I disagree. Okay, and tell me why. Um, I mean, it, somewhat of it's situationally um, dependent, but I think utilizing each resource isn't a, necessarily a bad thing. I mean, if that's your only focus, then potentially, but... Okay. So if I'm working on process improvement and I focus on something that is not the bottleneck, am I going to improve the, the throughput of the process? Mm. No. So I think that's the point that they're getting at. I don't disagree with what you're saying, and here's okay. why. So they're trying to get at the fact that <clears throat> you have to pay attention to where the bottleneck is. And so if you're focusing on other things besides the bottleneck, but here's what I find in reality. And it's just a, a if you focus on other areas and you can take time away from them and then you can transfer things from the bottleneck to them, that's still winning for the bottleneck, right? You're still able to make improvements there. But until you address the bottleneck, you're not, you're not actually improving your, your throughput. But, you know, it doesn't mean that if I look at this resource over here and I'm able, that's where I have the low-hanging fruit, and if I fix them, then I can take activities off of the bottleneck. That's still addressing the bottleneck, right? But that has to be your kind of overarching perspective is how are we going to address that bottleneck, okay? All right, so that being said, I'm going to go through the next um, five exercises um, kind of in the back of the book. And so I'm going to go ahead and based on our conversation, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to note taking. your handed camera. And actually, I don't want that either. I want this. It'll take me just a minute to get set up here. All right, so we're going to start with problem 5-1. And so 5-1 says that we have a law firm that specializes in the issuance of insurance policies covering large commercial real estate projects. And those projects fall into two categories, shopping centers and medical complexes. The typical work involved in each transaction is quite predictable and repetitive. The time requirements or unit loads for preparing a standard contract of each type are given in table 5-8. And they're also listed as the number of professionals of each type and the number of available hours per professional per day. The rest of the time is taken by other office activities. Okay, so. What page I'm, is this on? This is on page 115, and it's exercise 5.1. Can you just one page uh, <laughs> Get both <and> past it. <laughs> okay, so what, if you don't, is it all right if I kind of go at a diagonal? Is that okay? Can you still kind of read? Mm -hmm. All right. So basically we're saying that we have our resources. And we have three types of resources. Okay. And so our three types of resources are the paralegal, the tax lawyer, and the senior partner. Okay. And we have 
we're given our unit load for shopping. So <coughs> unit load is time in the numerator or the denominator for unit load. Hours per contract, right? So it's in the numerator. And it's four hours for a paralegal, one hour for a tax lawyer, and one hour for the senior partner. Okay? The unit load for medical is six, three, and one, respectively. Okay? And so then the number of professionals that we have of each, or the number of resources, is 4, 3, and 2. And then the hours that they're available per day. And this is a little bit of a twist, because in the past, we just said that they were available all day long, right? So the twist in this problem is we're saying, well, they're not available all day. The paralegals are available six hours a day, eight hours a day for the tax lawyer, and four hours a day for the senior partner. Okay. What's your top of that one? Hours uh, available per day. What's the one before that? The third. Is there a way to make that sharper? Is there a way to what? Make it sharp. That's that's better. The problem's going to be I'm going to have trouble getting everything in and getting it. So I'll do my best here, but. I mean, you can do it on Excel if you just, like, go slow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How about if I do it on Excel and you tell me when, I'm, when I need to slow down, okay? So I'll go ahead and transfer this over to Excel because I think that you're going to be able to see it better in Excel, and I will try to go slower. Not I will try, I will. Okay. And so the other thing about when I've set it up in Excel, the things that are in yellow are the things that are given to us in the con are in the from the problem. Okay? And so again, you've already written down this. We know that we have for a unit load hours per contract four, one and one, right? Six, three and one. Our number of professionals are four, three, and two. And the number of hours that they're available in the day are six, eight, and four. Okay. Okay. What's that? I didn't leave room for those. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you didn't leave room for those. So what I'll do is I'll move them out to the end. She says as though she can do that neatly. I'm going down. Okay. So, so the first question is, what's the effective capacity of the process? And the problem that we've got is that we have two products, right? So when we have two products, we have to come up with the artificial unit load, okay? And so the artificial unit load is the weighted average of those two products, okay? And so it's telling us that we have 75 of each type. So that just means it's a 50 of 150 total. So it means we have a 50-50 mix, right? So if I'm going to calculate this, so the column heading is artificial flow unit, which is load hours per contract. So I'm going to take this 4 times 50% plus 6 times 50%. In this case, we could just take the average, but we're not going to do that because you can only do that if it's a 50-50 split, right? So that means my artificial flow unit is 5, right? In the next case, my artificial flow unit is 1 times 0.5 plus 3 times 0.5 or 2. And for my senior partner... <coughs> It's 1 times 0.5 plus 1 times 0.5. And I know you're going to be surprised. That's going to equal 1. Where did you get the 50%? In the problem, it tells us that um, 
For the month of November, the firm has generated 150 orders, 75 of each type. So that's how I know that then that's 50% and 50%. Okay? All right. So then, so if I'm trying to get to the effective capacity of the process, right, how do I go from artificial flow unit to effective capacity? A, it, we've, we've done it in all of the other problems that we've done. So when I go from artificial flow unit, or when I go from unit load, right, 1 over 5. So I'm going to go, I'm going to take the inverse of that. So the effective capacity of that resource unit is 0.2, okay? And I'm going to take, to get from the unit load to the effective capacity, again, it's the inverse. So 1 over 2 is 0.5. And for the senior partner, 1 over 1, I know again you're surprised, is 1. Okay. So sometimes what it's easy, like if I'm taking my notes, I might label these columns A, B, C, and D. And then I might put what's going on with, so when I calculate artificial flow unit, I'm taking A times 50% plus B times 50%. Okay. And when I'm calculating this, <coughs> I'm taking... 1 over E, to, so I know, you know, that's the formula that I need to use in order to get there. All right? <clears throat> so, the effective capacity of a resource pool in terms of contracts per day, so how many can I do in one day? Four times. So, this is where it gets a little different. Yeah, we've got four professionals that are available for six hours per day, right? And they can, their effective capacity is 0.2 contracts per hour. So it's going to be, and it, if you label them, you know, we could say D times E times G in this example. It's this times this times this. And just think about that. I mean, it makes sense, right? If I were asking you how much could you do, you would say, well, I can do so many an hour, and I'm available for this many hours, and oh, by the way, there's three of the same type of me that's available. Okay? That's all we're doing here. And then if I want to com convert that to monthly capacity, I know that I have 20 days in a month because it tells me that in the problem. So I'm going to go that times 20, right? And that's going to tell me that I can do 96 of those in a day. So this is, again, information that was given to us in the problem. You just took the 4.8 times 20, you said? I did. Okay. <coughs> okay. And to get to the... If, go ahead, Abby. To do the contracts per day, you did the number of professionals times hours times the per hour. Okay. Times the effective capacity of that resource. And so then, when I want to do the um, effective capacity of a resource pool for the tax lawyers, it's I have three tax lawyers that are available for eight hours a day, and each of them can do a half of a contract per hour. It gives me 12. And then to move that to monthly, I'm going to take that 12 times 20. You could do that in one column if you wanted to, but I just wanted to break it up so you could see the steps in it. Okay? All right, and the effective capacity of um, our senior partner. We have two senior partners. They are available for four hours each per day, and it takes them uh, one, they can do one contract per hour. Okay, so that being said, I now have my monthly capacity for my paralegal, my tax lawyer, and my senior partner. So where's my bottleneck in that process? Paralegal? Paralegal, right? 
right? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> can the company process all 150 cases in November? No. No, because our bottleneck is the paralegal and they're only able to do 96. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if the firm wishes to process all of the 150 cases available in November, how many professionals of each type are needed? Okay. So we desire, this is how I get there, we desire to do 150 contracts per month, right? We know our effective capacity, we've calculated it here, right? That's the effective capacity of each resource unit, right? We know that a paralegal can do 0.2 contracts per hour, a tax lawyer can do 0.5 contracts per hour, and our senior partners can do one contract per hour. So I'm just going to insert that information here. And then that's going to tell me then how many hours I need in a given month, right? Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, um, I'm going to take 150. I'm going to divide it by the effective capacity in terms of contracts per hour. That's going to tell me that I need 750 paralegal hours. And in that same vein, I'm going to take 150 and divide it by 0.5. And that's going to tell me that I need 300 tax lawyer hours and 150 divided by 1. I know it's incredibly difficult math, but it's 150, right? So that tells me how many hours I need of each of those resources. But I also have to consider how many, you know, they're not available eight hours a day, right? We have, we're, we've been given that a paralegal is available for six hours per day. A tax lawyer is available for eight hours per day, and a senior partner is available for four. So that being the case, if I need 750 total hours and one resource is available for six hours a day, when I divide 750 divided by six, that tells me I need 100 and, and uh, wait, I did something wrong. What did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's per day, and they're 20 days in a month. There we go. So that means that I need 6.25 professionals needed. <clears throat> In the same vein, 300 divided by 8 hours available per day divided by 20 days in a month says that I need 1.875 <coughs> tax lawyers. 150 divided by 4 hours per day divided by 20 days says that I need 1.875 senior partners. Can you go back to the equation on that, that one? Which one? On oh, no, the number of professionals. So basically I'm saying I figured out how many hours I need in a given month to, co to complete 150 contracts. And then once I have that, then I have to look at the actual resource and say, well, how many hours a day or is that resource available? The hours needed for a month, did you just multiply those two? Divided. Oh. So 150 divided by 0.2. Because, so think about it this way. So I've got, um, I want 150 contracts, right? And this is, I can do 0.2 contracts per hour. So if I want to get to how many hours... I need to do contracts divided by contracts per hour. And that's going to move hour up to the numerator. Right? So then that becomes 150 contracts divided by 0.2 contracts per hour. Okay? So that's question one. Question 5.2 says. Reconsider the law firm in 5.1 and assume the prevailing revenues per shopping and medical project are 4,000 and 5,000 respectively. Okay? So, 
I'll just keep working it here, and that way we're just going down the page for you. Okay, so I won't start fresh there. Um, <clears throat> so and I may go a little smaller so that we can see a little bit more on the page. So what it's telling us is our revenues for, and we said that we have um, shopping and medical are 4000 and 5000 respectively. Is this, is this the second problem? Yep, this is 5-2. Okay, and so if that's the case, our out-of-pocket expenses associated with each project are negligible. Okay, so that that's telling us that there's no variable costs. Okay, so if we're saying there's really no variable costs, then you can say that with no variable costs, we're basically saying that our revenues are equal to our contribution margin. Okay. Because again, contribution margin is revenue minus variable cost. Okay. And we're saying the fixed cost is $500,000 per month. Got finger happy there. So then it says, well, what type of project is most profitable, right? And what we've emphasized today is that we can't just look at contribution margin. We have to look at contribution margin per unit of time, okay? And if I'm going to look at contribution margin per unit of time, I have to back up a step from where we were at <coughs> in 5.1, because in 5.1, we combine the products. When we're, and this is kind of a key point, because this is where some students will get confused, is we have to combine the the products to get an artificial unit load to get the capacity of the overall process. But when we begin to compare which one is more profitable, we have to separate them back out again. Okay? We have to look at each one individually. All right. So if that's the case, then um, <clears throat> we then have to say, well, let's look at shopping. And I need to do my unit load, right? And I need to do um, my effective capacity. And so this becomes just like what we did in our, your first homework. So for shopping, we said that our unit load for a paralegal was four hours per unit. Our unit load for a tax lawyer was one hour per unit, and our unit load for a senior partner was one hour per unit. So then to go from unit load to effective capacity, what do I do? Tori, what do I do? <coughs> unit load to effective capacity. One over. One over, right? So I'm just going to take the inverse. So now it becomes 1 divided by 4 is 0.25, 1 divided by 1 is 1, and 1 divided by 1 is 1, okay? And then the number of professionals and the hours that they were available in any given day was given to us in the problem. So I'm just going to grab that again. We have four paralegals, we have three tax lawyers, and we have two senior partners. They are available for, paralegals are available for six hours a day. Tax lawyers are available for eight hours per day. And uh, senior partners are available for four hours per day. <clears throat> so again, this is just information that was given to us in the problem. And so if I'm trying to calculate the effective capacity 
of a resource unit per day. Now it'll be messy, but we're going to go ahead and do it like this. And I do the green because we're going to calculate that. Okay. So, Julie, if I'm going to calculate the effective capacity of a paralegal per day, what am I going to do? For just the paralegal? For just the paralegal. Um, is that, wait, not artificial? No. Yeah, that's for both of them. We're just doing one. Yeah, so we're back to just doing one because we have to look at, when we go to look at profitability, we have to look at them on an individual basis. Okay. Um, number of professionals and then hours available. Okay. So I start with effective Perfect. capacity. Yep. And then I'm going to do times the number of professionals times the number of hours available in a day. And so that says that my um, paralegal is available for six hours a day. Or six, excuse me, their effective capacity is six units per day. My tax lawyer is one times three times eight for 24 units a day, and my senior partner is one times two times four for eight units a day. If I want to convert that to month, a month, right, all I'm going to do is take it times 20, because there's 20 days in a month. So that means that my, par that my uh, paralegal can do 120 contracts per day, my tax lawyer can do 480, and my senior partner can do 160. Okay. So again, this was shopping. Okay. And if I want to do, and what I need to do then is for the medical center, I just need to repeat that. Okay. So if I'm going to repeat that, I have to look at each of the individual resources, paralegal, tax lawyer, senior partner, right? Their unit load is the same, excuse me, their unit load is different because it's a different product. And so the unit load for the medical is six hours per contract for the paralegal, three for the tax lawyer, and one Okay, and again, this is information that's given to us in the problem. Miranda, if I want effective capacity, one divided, by one divided by six, one divided by three, and one divided by one. So it's 0 0.17, 0 0.33, and one. Okay. So I've calculated my effective capacity for medical, and then I need to use the number of professionals and the hours available that was given to us in the problem. So four paralegals, three tax lawyers, two senior partners, right? Six hours available for the paralegal, eight hours for the tax lawyer, and four for the senior partner. Okay. The joy of setting it up in Excel versus handwriting it, right? And I'll wait. I'll go ahead and copy and paste, right? And it's automatically going to calculate the effective capacity of the resource unit per day, taking the effective capacity times the number of professionals times the hours that they're available, right? So just exactly what we did up above. So a paralegal can do four contracts uh, per day, a tax lawyer can do eight, and a senior partner can do eight. All of this is to get to... Abby takes a big breath. <laughs> All of this is to get to what's the capacity of each of those different products. So what's the capacity of the shopping in a, um, <coughs> 120 per month? Yeah, and I'm sorry, I need to revise that to say month, don't I? I've got it per day, and it should be per month. And what's the um, capacity of the medical? 80 per month, right? And so if I'm trying to determine which is more profitable, right, I'm going to take that capacity up here and say, well, I can do 4,000 shopping and 5,000 medical 
in a month. And so if the question is which is more profitable, I'm going to say um, the contribution margin we said was 4,000. We said for medical was 5,000, right? The effective capacity is, we said, was 120 and 80. So the actual profit per month is 4,000 times 120. And 5,000 times 80. Okay, so again, it's that example of where your contribution margin per unit is actually higher, but your contribution margin per unit of time is lower. So you're better off doing more shopping because you can you actually make more money over time with those. Okay. So then they say, <laughs> at the current product mix, What's the value of hiring an extra paralegal? Okay. And so what I'm going to do, again, when I'm in Excel, right, we did all of this, right, earlier. And we said, well, if we have a paralegal, right, um, we have four paralegals. When we think about the, the value of hiring a paralegal, do we need to look at the mix of products or do we need to look at the individual products? Mix. We have to look at the mix because they're going to be doing both. So we need to. So that's the. That's the. You have to be thinking about well, which am I looking at individual products or am I looking at product mix? So if I'm looking at product mix, I can come back to this and I can say, well, <clears throat> if I were going to do that. I would say if I hired one more paralegal, if I went from four till five, and if I've done this in Excel, it's just going to convert it to 120, right? You see, adding one paralegal changes my monthly capacity from 96 to 120. So that means that that difference between 120 minus 96 is 24 contracts, okay? But the question is, what value do I place on those contracts, right? And so we need to do a weighted average of the, the value of the contracts, too. So um, we would say that <clears throat> um, we would say that at if we were doing, what did we say, 50-50, so our average of four and 5,000, is 4,500. Sorry. So our if we hired one extra paralegal, right, that would net us an extra $108,000 in contribution margin, right? And so, you know, if you said I could hire one uh, paralegal for, you know, how many, you suppose, let's be 4000 a month, that would definitely be worth it, right? You started to look at that, the capacity issue that you've got here. And when it becomes, if I said I were going to hire two, right, still takes me to 144, which is, let's just actually let this float with it too. If I hired two, it would bring 216,000. If I hired three, can I can I say it's going to be a $324,000 profit? Why not? Because now I've shifted the bottleneck. It's going to be some portion of that, right? Because it's close, right? We've got it's still 160, so that's an improvement, but it's not. We're not going to get the full bang for the buck on hiring that extra paralegal, right? So that's how you kind of start to walk through those, all right? <clears throat> okay. Let's 
see. So we've done that. Um, at the, it says at the current product mix, how much contribution margin is generated per day? Okay. Um, and so so if I were asked that question, if I were to ask you that question, at the current product mix, so that's this product mix, how would I determine how much contribution margin is generated per day? There's supposed to be four yeah. instead of five. How would I determine how much contribution margin is generated per day? That's my capacity, right? So how many, if it's a 50-50, how many medical and how many shopping am I doing? If I have a 50-50 split, how many medical contracts am I doing and how many? <coughs> 96 times 0.5 gives me 48. So I'm going to do 48 of each type of contract, right? And again, it's 4,000 for medical and 5,000 for shopping. I feel like you're you're it's a lot of number crunching, right? That's what it is, and so you have to. You have to start thinking about what do the numbers mean to me, right? And so if we're talking about capacity, you're saying, if we're saying, you know, well, how do I determine how much revenue I've got? You have to take how, much, how many medical are you doing, how many shopping are you doing? Well, you can only do what you have capacity for, and we only have capacity for 96. So 50% of 96 is 48, so we're doing 48 medical and 48 shopping. Chelsea? Could you not just take the 96 times 4,500? Um, so let's try that. <clears throat> Yep, you can in this case. The thing that the reason that I hesitate to do that, and I need to, and I need to walk through the math, is it works when it's a 50-50 split. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not so sure that it works as well when it's not a 50-50 split. Right. I was just talking about for this problem. You could it is for this 50. problem, but that's I try to show you the way <coughs> that you have to do it for across all, and and I'll show you why I get hesitant about that because when we start to work with unit load and effective capacity, we have to work with unit load to get the artificial unit load. You can't take the percentage and apply it to capacity because it doesn't work, okay? <coughs> so, yes? Is that dollars per day? Because it's monthly capacity, Yeah, this correct? is per month. This okay. This is per month. And so if the question is per day, we would just divide it by 20. Okay. To get back to, to, get back to how many per day. Okay. All right? All right, let's call that one dead and move on to 5-3. Do you need me to wait, or are you guys good to, for me to go on? Miranda, I see you're kind of... Oh, I'm good. Okay. All right. So 5-3, I love this problem just because of the names that are in it. Three hairstylists, Francois, Bernard, and Mimi, right? We have to get pretty... Uh, run fast service hair salon for busy professionals in the Gold Coast area of downtown Chicago. They stay open from 6.45 a.m. to 9 p.m. in order to accommodate as many people's work schedules as possible. They perform only shampooing and hairstyling activities. Okay? And so, <clears throat> on average, it takes 10 minutes to shampoo. Okay, so that's the shampooing takes 10 minutes. Uh, 15 minutes to style the hair. And 5 minutes to bill the customer. When a customer arrives, he or, or she first checks in with the receptionist, Bernard's younger sister, Lulu. This takes only three minutes, okay? So they're three minutes checking in with Lulu, 
and then they're 30 minutes with the stylist, right? 10, 15, and 5, because they're doing the shampooing, the styling, and the billing. Okay. One of the three stylists then takes charge of the customer and performs all three activities, shampooing, styling, and billing consecutively. What is the number of customers that can be served per hour in this hair salon? Okay. So let's do Lulu, right, is our receptionist, and everyone else is a hairstylist. Okay. So what's Lulu's minutes per customer? Right. So Lulu's going to be three minutes per customer. And what's the stylist minutes per customer? 30. 30, right? And so my unit load is the inverse. Excuse me. If I want to I first want to convert my unit load to hours per customer. Okay. So I'm going to go if it's um, three minutes per customer, I'm going to divide that by 60 to get to my hours per customer. I'm going to divide it by 60 minutes per hour. And so 30 divided by 60 minutes per hour gives me 0.5. Then when I go from unit load to effective capacity, I'm taking the inverse, right? Everybody on board with unit load to capacity is the inverse. So I'm going to take 1 and divide it by 0.05. So that says that the receptionist can do 20 customers per hour. And it says that the hairstylist can do, an individual hairstylist can do two customers per hour. We have one receptionist. We have three stylists. And they're each available for 14.25 hours per day we go back to our problem. So the effective capacity of that resource pool <coughs> is going to be the 20 units per hour that Lulu can do times, we've only got one Lulu, times she's available for 14.25 hours per day. So Lulu can do uh, 285. Everyone else, so I have two customers per hour times three stylists times 14.25 hours per day can do 85.5. So then the question is, well, what's the number of customers that can be served by the hair salon? 85.5, right? That's our bottleneck, okay? So a customer or a fast service hair salon, an operation specialist, has suggested that the billing operation be transferred to Lulu, okay? And so if I transfer the billing operation to Lulu, what changes about our setup? So we know that the billing is five minutes of this 30-minute time frame, right? So what changes? The unit load. Right. So I need to change... And so um, you can write this down if you want to, or you can just make notes on how we do it. But basically, then I'm going to change this unit load to 8, and the stylus unit load to what? 25. 25. And so what we can see is we now increase from 85.5 to 102.6 customers going through that because we were able to shift operations away from the bottleneck. Okay. All right. That, I think, is going to do it. We're out of time. Um, I was going to go over 5.4 and 5.5. Five. Um, it's more about which product is more profitable. We went through those slow enough that I think if you've got questions, you can come back and look at these. Um, and then the other thing to remember is that um, you cannot calculate an artificial unit load off of effective capacity. You have to calculate it off of the unit load. So... You know, just make sure you're walking through the process in those steps to get your artificial unit load as opposed to there is no artificial effective capacity to get the unit load and the operational
All right, thanks for your patience. I know that gets kind of dry going through those problems, but I think it will help you when you sit down and go through your homework.